This week we're going to start beginning the mathematics portion of the course, and we're going to start with set theory relations and functions. Now, we use mathematics to have a formal way to describe our word categories and things in the world. So this week we're just focusing on set theory, and set theory is going to give us a way to talk about things like proper names. So if we have people in the world like Kate, Steve, and so on, we want to be able to represent those people. So set theory is going to give us a way to talk about objects and group them together. So for instance, we can use set theory to talk about all the people in link 324. We can use it to talk about all the people in link 322. And we can use manipulations on those to talk about the people that are in both 324 and 322, or 322 or 324, or maybe the people taking 324, but not the people taking 322, and so on. We'll also be able to use set theory to describe properties of things, such as nouns and adjectives. So if something is a dog, we can talk about a group of all the dogs in the world. If something is happy, we can talk about the group of all things that are happy in the world. So if we want to talk about happy dogs, then we just take both of those sets together and we see what is in both. Next week, we'll talk about relations and functions. And relations are going to let us talk about verbs. So this will talk about the connection between the subject and the object in a sentence. And then functions are going to be a way of sorting in a way. Or we can think of functions as giving us truth. So if you have a sentence, is that sentence true or false? Functions are going to let us do that. So this is a formalism for semantics. So when we teach this stuff and when I teach this stuff, some of it is abstract, but I'm going to try to use pictures and linguistic examples alongside the abstract explanation so that way you get a definition just like a mathematician would, but you also get some concrete examples like a linguist would need in order to really get this stuff. So we'll start off with sets. And a set is just a collection of objects. So it can be anything. It can be concrete, abstract, whatever. So for example, I have two different sets here. We'll start off with a set of English vowels. So we can draw this visually. And usually with sets, what we do is we draw a little circle, and we say that's a set, uh, and we give it a title. So I can give this the title V for vowels, or I can write out the whole word vowels, that's fine. And in English, orthography, what vowels do we have? Well, we have A, we have E, I, O, and U. So we can put them in this little set, and this is a set of vowels. So these are all the vowels we have in English. Now this is a visual way of representing it, but we have a formal way of doing this. So we would write vowels or capital V for our set. Typically we give sets just a capital letter, but we can write out a whole word if we want. Uh, we can say equals to be, how do we define the set? And then we put all of our elements in curly braces with commas in between them. So in this case, we would have A, E, I, O, and U. And the order doesn't matter. So E, I, A, U, O would be fine. Uh, U, O, I, E, A, that's also fine. So we can do uh, mathematical sets too. So if we want to count numbers, we have this special symbol uh, with an N. It's a boldface N, and that contains all the numbers from 1, 2, 3, and so on. But that's not really something that we're going to use too much as linguists, especially in this course. So here's another one we could do. Let's think in terms of phonetics. Let's say we want to talk about all of the different stops in English. Well, we know what the stops are, so let's put these in. Uh, we have P, T, K, we have B, D, and G. So these are our stops. We could represent this by saying, let's call this S for stops, and this would equal the set containing, well, six things. It's gonna have P, T, K, B, D, and G. So let's write these in and order doesn't matter. But this would be the set of stops in English. So we can use sets to represent these things. And you can see how in phonology, if you've taken Link 321 and you think about rules and phonological changes, really a natural class is just a set. So this set we have here is just the natural class of stops in English. But we've just represented this with mathematical notation. So every single object that is inside a set, like P, T, K, B, D, and G here, these are called elements. So an object in a set is called an element. If it's not in the set, then it's not an element of that set. And I have some examples here. So just a little definition. If we have some object little a, so this can be anything, it can be a number, it can be a person, it can be a thing, 
and it's an element of the set which we'll call capital A, then we write little a is an element of capital of big A. And this is just a modified epsilon. So you might have seen epsilon written like this before. Well, this is a variation of epsilon that is used to represent set membership. Uh, if the element is not part of that set A, we just put a little line through it. So we would like to do this, the element symbol with a line through it. So here's an example. Let's say we have a set of ingredients, just call this capital M. Again, the letters are all arbitrary. And in this set, we have sugar, milk, eggs, flour, and baking soda. So what's in the set? Well, sugar's in the set. So because sugar's in the set, we can write sugar is an element of M because the set is named M and sugar's in it. But let's think about tomato. Well, tomato's not in this set. So we would say that tomato is not an element of M. So again, this is just read as is not an element. So let's just do two more examples for this set. For instance, we know that flour is in this set. So we can say that flour is an element of M. Well, what's not in the set? Well, this is a list of baking ingredients, for example. So, of course, if we have something like a table, well, a table is not going to be in our set M. Okay, so this is just an example of how we can write whether something is in a set or not. And if we have a group of people, for example, like a group of people in Link 324, we want to know who's inside and who's outside. So, for example, we can say Taylor is an element of the students taking Link 324, that set, while someone named Chung Min is not in this course. So he would not be an element of our Link 324 set. Now here's just a, a little a vocabulary thing. If a set only has one element in it, or one member, or one object in it, then it's called a singleton. So suppose we have a set B, which is all the main characters in the, in the Titanic, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, he played a character named Jack. So if we let B equal that set, which is just Jack in it, so we can see there's only one element in here, then this set is called a singleton. You can also call it a one element set. It's fine. Uh, this is just a term that people tend to use when you have a set that only has one element in it. Now, if we were to draw this, again visually I should draw this for you just so you can see, this would be the set B. You can draw a little circle, and the only thing in it is Jack. So. Uh, this is a visual representation of that set right there. Okay, now we have some set conventions, and these are really important conventions actually. So the first idea is that sets are unordered. So the order of the elements does not matter, which means that if you have, say, A, B, C, D, and E, it's the same thing as E, D, B, C, and A. That's the same thing as B, E, D, A, C. There's a lot of different combinations for this. I think there's, what, like 120 different ways we could write this set if we wanted. And as long as the elements are the same, the order does not matter. Another thing is that when we have multiple of the same elements, we do not include them twice. So, for example, in this set down here, we have A, B, A, B, C, A, B. So we have A repeated three times, but we don't care how many times it's in there. We just care whether A is in the set at all. So we only have to write it once. Uh, same, we have B three times, but we only write it down once. And C only appears once, and we only write it down once. So both of these sets only have three different elements to them. Even though A is repeated three times on the left and B is repeated three times on the left, it doesn't matter. It's still only three distinct elements. Now, one important thing about sets, and thinking about it as a computer, for example, is a good way of thinking about this, because computers don't have any understanding of what you put into them. All it sees are symbols. Uh, a letter is a symbol, a number is a symbol, a group of letters is just a group of symbols that we'll call a word, but it doesn't know uh, if two different things are the same or not. And it's the same with these sets. So elements are particular. That means if you have something that is just can without quotation marks and can with quotation marks, these are treated as two different things. So I have an example here. We have one, we have quotation marks one, and we have one with a single quote after it. And these are all different elements. So if we were to draw this set out on the right here, this has three different things in it. This has one, this has one with quotation marks, and then it has just one with the single quote after it. 
can also call it one prime. Prime is uh, what's usually given to uh, that symbol in mathematics. So that has uh, three different elements in it. Okay, so these are just some set conventions. But there's, there's a couple more. Uh, one is, well, they're not really conventions, they're just more notations and things that we can have here. So if a set does not have any members at all, it's called the empty set. And we use this little symbol. It's a circle with a line through it. And if I draw this set visually, it just looks like this. There's nothing inside of it. And if we do the curly brace formal notation, we also see nothing inside of it. So it's just two brackets without anything. And that is called the empty set or the null set. I typically use the word empty set um, because I think it describes it quite well. It's a set with nothing in it. It is empty. You will either see this notation with curly braces or the notation with the circle with the line through it. And typically this symbol is used. So we just put the circle with the line through it and that's usually what we use for the empty set. But the curly braces can be used for visualization. Now, this part here is probably the thing that trips people up the most. And that is that a set can have another set as an element. And don't think too hard about this, just think about symbols. Think about what is in the set. So if we take a look at uh, the set B here, it has three things. It has an element A, it has an element B, and then it has an element which is a set itself. So I want to draw this first. So this is B, this is our set, what is inside? Well, the element A is in there, so A is an element of B. The B is in this set, so little b is an element of B. And then we also have uh, this set, which is C, D, and this is an element of B. So when we count how many things we have in here, we just have three different things. We have A, we have B, and then we have this other set. So one way of doing this is to draw all these things out, or you can just look for the main commas in the set. So you see a comma after A, you see a comma after B, you have this set thing going on, and then there's nothing. This is a lot like when you have a syntactic tree in bracket notation. So imagine we have a sentence, and then we have an NP, and then we have a VP. I'm going to pick a really quick sentence here. So NP is just going to be Steve, and then VP is going to be slept. If we ask ourselves how many phrases come directly out of S, well, we can draw this, right? We can draw an NP and a VP. But really, it's as if this set just has two things in it. It has a noun phrase and it has a verb phrase. That's what the sentence has. Now you can go into the noun phrase and you can break it down more. You can go into the verb phrase and break it down more. But when you just take a look at the sentence note and what's coming out of it, there's a noun phrase and a verb phrase. That's two things. Now, it's not 100% clear that these two things are related, uh, but I think it's a good analogy for when we think about sets being elements of sets. You know, you can have phrases within phrases. That's fine. You can also have words within phrases. So we'll do some practice with this. So because this is a video, I want you to pause this and just say whether each of these statements are true or false, but try it yourself. Now I'm going to go through the answers right away. So we have A, and here's a set. It contains the elements Y, Z, Q, X. It has the set RT, V, the set W, and then Y. So I want to draw the set out for us. So I'm going to use green to draw the set. Okay, I have Y in here. I have Z in here. I have Q. I have X. I have the set RT. I have V. I have the set W. And then I have Y, but I already have Y in the top left, so we don't need to repeat that twice. Okay. So let's ask ourselves some questions. Is X an element of A? Well, I see it up here in the set list. I see X just sitting on its own. So yes, this is true. Visually, if I look over here, oh, there's X right there. It's sitting out on its own. X is an element of A. Okay. I'm going to get rid of these markings as we go along as to not clutter the space but I'll try to switch colors for every single question. Okay, is the set containing X an element of A? Well, I need to find this exact thing in A, so I need to find the curly brace with an X. Now, if I look in the set A above, I don't find that. I just find X on its own. I don't find a set containing X. Visually, I just see X on its own here. I do not see 
I do not see this thing in A. So the answer here is false, because I do not find this symbol, this set containing X, in our set A. So that one is going to be false. Whoops, let me just clear this up a little bit. Okay, next question. Is R an element of A? So what I need to find here is I just need to find R on its own in the set A. So I look element by element. I see Y, Z, Q, X. I see the set containing R, T. So R is in here, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for just R on its own in our set A. Uh, I have V, I have a set containing W. So no, I do not see this in here. I do not see just R on its own in A. But what I do see is the set containing R, T, but that's not just R on its own. So no, we do not have R as an element of A. Okay, next one. What about is the set containing W an element of A? So I need to find this thing in A. I need to find curly brace with a W in it. And if I take a look uh, in the set above, well, I see it right here. I see the set containing W as an element. It's between our commas there. And if I take a look visually on the right, I see the set containing W right there. So this one is true. The set containing W is an element of A because this symbol, curly brace W curly brace, is in our set. Okay, let's get rid of this. Next one. Okay, so now we're done with A. Now we're looking at other sets. And this is really to get you into the mindset of having a set as an element. So I'm asking, is the set of the set containing C an element of the set of the set of the set containing C? Oh boy. So if I draw this, if I draw this, I have a set. And in this set, I have this element. I have C in there. Because remember, these two brackets on the outside tell us where the set begins and where it ends and everything in between is the element, or the elements. In this case, there's only one element. So the answer for this one is true, because if I take a look, this element here is found directly there. And if I take a look at how I've drawn this set, I see this symbol. I see the set containing the set containing C in our set here. So this one is true. And I understand if this is a little bit, you know, mind-boggling at first, but we're really just working with abstract definitions here. We're not really working with concrete objects yet. When you do concrete objects, then we might not see things as in-depth as this, but we want our definitions to hold so that way when you do encounter real things, you're able to work with those. Now, F. Well, let's get rid of our set here. Is the empty set an element of the empty set? Okay, well, what this means, <laughs> Let's just write this out. The empty set is equal to this set. So curly brace with nothing inside. If, if the empty set is an element of, let's just say any set. In fact, maybe it's better if I don't write this out. Maybe if it's better if I draw this. Uh, so this is the empty set, right? Now, if the empty set is an element of the empty set, I would need to find this thing inside of it. I would need to find the empty set symbol inside of that set. However, the empty set has nothing in it. So we cannot find this set, the empty set, in our empty set. So this is false. Now what I want to do right away is I want to show you what it would look like if the empty set was an element of a set. So the empty set is an element of the set containing the empty set. So it's true if we have a set that has the empty set in it. So these two things are true. The right is a visual representation of what we have on the left. So we can see how that compares with this example. You know, because this is really the same thing as just having a curly brace with nothing inside of it. And clearly, in this case, we don't see this empty set symbol inside of here. That is not happening. Okay, finally, the last example. Is F an element of the set which contains the set containing F? 
So let's draw this here. So here's our set. Inside we have an element, which is the set containing f. Now I need to see, do I see just f on its own inside this set? And the answer is no, I don't. So this is also false. I don't see f as an element of that set. What I do see though, is I see that the set containing f is an element of the set containing the set containing f. And excuse me, the, the more curly braces I do in a time they get sloppier. It's just, <laughs> you'll find that you do it yourself too. Okay, so at first, at first these questions are not easy, but as you do more practice, you get more comfortable with these. So if you have any questions, remember, ask on the discussion board. Now one more thing as we go through, the size of sets. The size of a set has a specific name. It's called the cardinality. And this tells us how many distinct elements are in the set. So if we have a set A, to find the cardinality or to denote the cardinality, we put uh, these little bars beside it. So you might remember these absolute values in high school math. Uh, this just means the size of things. So how many things are in the set. And a set can have a finite number of elements or it can have an infinite number of elements. So let's just figure out what the cardinality of each of these following sets are. I'll do the first one for you, then you can pause and you can try the rest. So P, uh, how many elements? Let's count. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of these are different elements, so we can say that the cardinality of P is equal to nine, because P has nine elements in it. Now pause the video, try the rest of these on your own. Okay, B, the set E is the set containing the empty set. So if I draw this out, this is what I have. I have a set with the empty set inside of it. So yes, this set has one element. E has one element. It has the empty set as an element. So the cardinality of E is one. Now, to contrast this, if we take a look at the empty set itself, the cardinality of the empty set is zero because it looks like this. There is nothing inside of it. Okay, let's do all the integers. So when we have a dot dot dot, this is a pattern. And we see a pattern on both sides here. So the pattern implies that we have 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and it just keeps going on forever. And on the right side, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that keeps going on forever. So the cardinality of the integers here, this is C, uh, is infinite. So it just has an infinite number of things. And perhaps I should make this a little bit nicer when I write this. Hardly nicer, <laughs> but it does look a little better. So that's infinite. Let's take a look at x. Okay, let's draw this set out. Uh, this is x. This has, okay, it has f in it. It has a in it. And then it has this set containing b and c. Okay, so if we count how many things there are, there are three things in this set. There's f, there's a, and there's the set containing b and c. So three different elements. Remember, the set containing b and c is just one element inside that larger set. Okay, let's take a look at E, which is Y. Now, if we draw this set out for Y, what do we find? Well, we have F, we have A, we have B, and we have C. So we have four different things here. So the cardinality of Y is equal to four. Finally, let's take a look at Z. Let's draw Z out. Well, if we take a look inside Z, we just have one element here. We have this set containing f, a, b, and c. So the size of our set z is just equal to one. There's one element in it, and that is the set containing f, a, b, and c. Okay, so that's it for this video. This is just about the basics of counting objects and little conventions about these sets. So we haven't really done anything concrete yet, but in reality, when we do this stuff with semantic, tr uh, with semantic trees, with syntax trees, and we talk about meanings of sentences, Typically, we think of sets as being groups of people, or we think of it as being groups of pairs of people. So depending on whether you have an intransitive verb that just needs a subject, or a transitive verb that needs a subject and an object, you know, these are groups of people, groups of things. And we'll see how we can compare groups uh, in the third video this week. But if you have any questions, as always, discussion board, email, 
either is fine. Try the mastery exercise once first, then if you have some problems with it, come back to the practice, try, look at the definitions again, try some more problems, and then do the mastery exercise again.